Welcome back to Module 5. In this video, we're going to be talking about what happens when high mass stars die. Uh, and there's a lot of cool things in this video, but I also want to make sure that we understand that uh, although we're going to be learning about all these different terms that we probably knew about before this class, we also have a lot of misconceptions about how common they are and how these different events and objects work. So try to keep your eye out for things that you think you know about and check to see if that actually is the case or you want to explore a little bit deeper uh, with us in our curriculum. So we ended uh, last video talking about white dwarfs, but leading up to that, we talked about how low mass stars can all turn on the triple alpha process. So their cores can turn three helium into one carbon with some energy to power itself, to push back against gravity. High mass stars do this also. They won't have to do it all at once. It's not gonna be as instantaneous as this graph for a low mass star suggests. They can actually go through multiple stages of fusion where it, it does have this kind of back and forth nature to it where um, each stage of fusion takes a l shorter and shorter amount of time until as this uh, high mass star is really getting kind of stressed that it can't push back against gravity, the last stage of fusion is silicon into iron, uh, and that stage lasts about a day, like 24 hours, which is an unthinkably short amount of time on astronomical scales. So let's stop and talk about why iron is the stopping point, because that is actually a really key piece of information for us. So, nuclear reactions will produce energy if when we go from the starting materials to the ending materials, we end up with extra leftover energy because mass doesn't quite work the same way that we think it might uh, at the atomic level. So what really we wanna think about in this moment is are we going up the binding energy curve shown on the screen here or down it? If we try to do a reaction that brings us downhill um, in either direction, we're gonna have to put energy into that process. Uh, and if we go uphill, we're gonna get energy out of that process. So there's a peak to this um, binding energy curve and there's a um, kind of maximum binding energy in a sense. And that happens with iron. Iron has a mass number around 56 and fusion will continue to give us energy until that point. We could still go through fusion to higher elements and that does happen with um, high energy events, but we have to put energy into that process to get those bigger elements. And fission, like uh, nuclear uh, reactors on Earth, they can break large uh, elements down into smaller ones because they're still going up the binding energy curve. It's less effective than what stars are doing in their cores, um, but it is certainly something that will produce energy. Iron, though, in either direction we get to it, is the stopping point for getting energy out of the process. So, low mass stars end with just the triple alpha process, leaving their cores to be carbon, maybe carbon and oxygen together, and they'll become a white dwarf at the end. That is the majority of all stars. However, high mass stars, so we're talking about something bigger than 10 solar masses, more mass than 10 solar masses, will continue so that we've got layers and layers of different fusion and byproducts, and the core leaves, um, ends this process as iron iron that will not give us any additional energy. There is no way to push back against the pull of gravity. So when that happens in that um, few hours left when the silicon is turned to iron, when that happens, the whole iron core collapses down. All of the electrons are squeezed into the nuclei of the atoms in the core, converting all of the protons and electrons into neutrons. This is a catastrophic event the bounce back through the outer layers creates a huge flash of um, explosion, basically. And this is also going to be bright like the type 1 supernova, but this is a type 2 supernova. We're going to make sure that we distinguish between those two before we leave this um, set of slides. Now this type 2 supernova, which is when a um, massive star has a core collapse, leaves behind possibly something at its core, but we know that the type 1 supernova from a white dwarf pushed past its mass limit leaves nothing behind. Everything's exploded. So it's going to be um, 
a kind of toss up on what we expect to be left over with these type 2 supernova. Now this slide shows five different host galaxies very far away from us, seen by Hubble, that have a type 2 supernova event in the top of the two uh, images. And when we're kind of watching that galaxy in its normal uh, configuration, that's the bottom image. So you can see that these are not very high resolution, not because Hubble Space Telescope is a bad telescope, but because these are so far away. And you can see that for a brief moment, the type two supernova can outshine its entire host galaxy for a couple of um, hours or even days. One really well-known example in the astronomy community is Supernova 1987A. The name tells us when it was seen. So in 1987, an astronomer was kind of looking outside on a break between observations at night and noticed in the patch of sky where he had been studying a something that didn't quite belong, a kind of extra bright star it almost looked like, but he knew that part of the sky very well and realized that 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 bright object wasn't supposed to be there. He let people know within the supernova community that this might be something to track because he had enough background knowledge to know that this is probably something that's a big deal. And indeed, over the next um, hours and days and weeks, uh, the whole astronomy community was tracking supernova 1987A. This was the most recent event that has been seen by eye, the most recent supernova event that has been seen by eye without a telescope. The last time that happened was in 1604 um, with Kepler, and before that was 1570, uh, 1574 um, with Tycho, uh, Brahe, Tycho's star. Uh, we mentioned it briefly in his uh, background history. So it is rare to see a supernova by eye, and those two previous examples were not even this type of supernova. This type of supernova, type 2 supernova, a high mass star at the end of its life, um, they're very rare to begin with, and we would not want them happening in our solar neighborhood. They're very intense events. Uh, this was actually not even in our, in our galaxy. It was in a neighboring dwarf galaxy called the Large Magellanic Cloud, and we're going to be learning about that, uh, that system, that dwarf galaxy, in Module 6. One of the interesting things about Supernova 1987A was it was so powerful and so well studied right from the beginning that we were able to measure neutrinos and um, be able to link them to that specific event. So our neutrino telescopes that normally study the sun, we were able to detect the anomaly that was consistent with that supernova rather than being solar neutrinos. And we're still monitoring the remnant today. This animation shows about a decade worth of data, um, but it continues to be something where we can see changes from one year to the next as the kind of explosion continues outward through the gas and dust in the surrounding area. So kind of neat to realize that uh, even these large scale astronomical things, there are still moments that we can observe uh, in humanity and, and it's, it's exciting to be part of those moments. So supernova 1604, the last time that um, a supernova event was observable to the human eye was way back in 1604. Between then and now, it has faded so that it does not create very much visible light. The visible light is color-coded yellow here in this series of images. But again, we can still kind of track what's going on here. This particular event, though, was a type 1a supernova. From the previous video, we learned that type 1a supernova are for white dwarfs that have gone past their uh, maximum mass and explode because of that. Type 1a supernova leave nothing behind. Uh, they are low mass stars that have this interaction which, where they gained extra mass. And we need to make sure that we separate the two types of supernova. It is important to us to be able to distinguish the two ways that stars or stellar remnants have the ability to have this catastrophic failure. So low mass stars, they lose their outer layers at the end of their life as a planetary nebula. And even though some can create a type 1a supernova in a binary system, that happens well after the, the death of the star has actually occurred. 
high mass stars end their life with this massive explosion um, as a type 2 supernova. So what we want to know is what is left over at the core of a type 2 supernova, at the center of the type 2 supernova. Is there any of the original star's core left over, or does it get completely annihilated like a type 1a supernova does? There's nothing that is shining in the center of these um, objects, so we have to figure out what it is um, that might or might not be there with follow-up observations that aren't just shining visible light. So until the 1960s, we did not have an answer to this question. Astronomers didn't know if there was anything left behind after a type 2 supernova because there was nothing observable. It was Jocelyn Bell Burnell that discovered, as a graduate student, that there was a specific type of radio signal that seemed like fast pulses, faster than any object known to astronomy at the time could make, and what she determined was that these pulses would be consistent with, instead of flashes, a single consistent beam of radiation, of radio waves um, and possible other radiation that sweeps across our view like a lighthouse does. So this was the lighthouse model. And because it comes through the radio signal as pulses, she called it a pulsar. At the time, though, in the 1960s, astronomers around the world were kind of nicknaming these objects LGM-1, LGM-2, to stand for Little Green Men, because it was unknown, beyond aliens, uh, it was unknown what could create such a fast burst, because this would have to be something rotating extremely, extremely fast, much faster than any star, any regular star, could. And most of these objects, most of these LGM objects, um, known as pulsars now, uh, didn't seem to have any visible light component to that part of the sky. It took until uh, this same signal was seen in the Crab Nebula, which was a known type 2 supernova from 1054 Common Era. So 1054, there was a big supernova explosion seen by eye, recorded in cultures around the world, uh, and that was a high mass star at the end of its life. That supernova remnant uh, is still quite impressive and quite beautiful to see through a telescope. In x-rays, we can see the same beams that uh, Jocelyn Bell Burnell had noticed in the radio waves, and this time we're able to see the beam structure itself and not just the pulses as the lighthouse looks at us, uh, and that really connects the model with um, observations. So a pulsar is a special type of neutron star. So this became kind of a confirmation that when that type 2 supernova happened, where all of the electrons got crunched down and electrons plus protons created neutrons, it became confirmation that this object was all of those neutrons just kind of packed together as one gigantic um, nucleus, but not on our periodic table because there were no protons left, uh, just one giant nucleus full of neutrons packed together like holding marbles, where you can't really squash them down anymore, they feel solid, neutrons were up against each other basically feeling solid as well. So gravity trying to push everything inward is uh, balanced by the neutrons themselves, the marbles pushing back. The neutron degeneracy pressure is telling us that we are able to hold back gravity, but not through fusion creating gas pressure, not through the electron clouds like our balloon analogy from the previous video, but by neutrons, kind of dense, um, solid, as best we can say, neutrons. Now if we think back to the um, structure of the atom from way back in module three, we learned that an atom is mostly empty space, and these neutron stars have taken all that empty space away. So we want to recognize that neutron stars have more mass than white dwarfs, because if they had less mass, they would have stopped and made a white dwarf. This condensed way past that point before we ever made any stable white dwarf to begin with. So more mass than a white dwarf, but we have taken all of that extra space out of every atom. 
So instead of being the size of Earth, the physical size of Earth is what we can think of for a white dwarf. Instead, a neutron star has slammed down to be about the size of a city. So we have a neutron star that is maybe double the mass of the sun, taking about the space of um, a city like Boston or downtown Chicago. So absolutely incredibly dense. Um, the number on the slide isn't even meaningful to us. It's too dense to even picture. If we were to take a teaspoon of neutron star material, it would weigh 100 million tons in Earth's gravity. It would just, it would just fall and break our spoon and go into the Earth. Um, it's just not possible to truly fathom. What we want to recognize is that neutron stars have big masses, but very small sizes really important to distinguish those two pieces of information because they are quite different. Now, like white dwarfs, there is a maximum mass. The white dwarf maximum mass was the chandra sekhar limit. The neutron star mass limit is still um, under debate and being studied. Astronomers estimate that it's around three solar masses, and the details of the TOV limit are outside the scope of this course. If you're interested, certainly you can look them up on your own. But what we care about is that stars that are between about 10 solar masses and 40 solar masses to begin with will leave behind a core that is almost certainly going to make a neutron star. And that neutron star will have a mass between 1.4 solar masses, because below that would be a white dwarf, and about three solar masses. The reason for that upper limit is because at some point gravity can win. We had that neutron degeneracy pressure that we talked about, like holding that um, handful of marbles. If we had an industrial press, we could crunch those marbles down into um, dust. And if we're thinking about like gravity as this, this true impressive force, gravity can, if it gets strong enough, condense all material down um, past anything that can hold itself back against gravity. When that happens, we get the breaking of physics, and we get a black hole, which you've probably been waiting a little while to hear about because you knew about them before this class. When a star over 40 solar masses dies, its core will collapse down into a single, infinitely small point, no volume, no size, but some amount of mass. That breaks physics when we start to talk about infinite, whether it's infinitely large or infinitely small, physics gets a little bit wonky. So it actually breaks what we can study um, up to a certain distance. So the singularity is the true size of the black hole, but a lot of the times it's easier for us to think of as the, bl the back black hole as being the extent to which physics is messed up. And that goes out to a um, distance, a um, kind of region all around, a spherical region called the event horizon, whose distance out from the singularity is determined by the Schwarzschild radius. Big fancy name, we don't need the, the name of it, but what I do want us to notice is that radius cares about capital G, which is just the universal constant of gravity, it's not a variable. It cares about C, the speed of light, also not a variable. So the only thing that truly determines the physical size of a um, black hole event horizon is its mass. So mass really determines everything about all of the processes we're learning about in module five. So light cannot escape a black hole if it goes past the event horizon. So if a photon gets closer than the event horizon, it will not be able to escape because that radius is set as the distance that you would be where the escape velocity, how fast your spaceship would need to go to escape, is equal to the speed of light. If you're outside the event horizon, you can escape. It will be difficult, but you can. Inside, you cannot. But what's really important for us to know, because we're gonna have to confront a lot of like Hollywood misconceptions, is that outside the event horizon, physics behaves the way it needs to. There are interesting effects, absolutely, from um, general relativity, special relativity, things like that, that are in our textbook, um, if you're curious, in chapter 24. But gravity is not different. The force of gravity equation works the way that we learned way back when we first introduced it in module three. Black holes are not 
giant space vacuums. They're not just pulling everything from all directions all of the time. That is not how it works. They are simply mass that is packed down into a smaller space, which means that it's easier to get close to them without necessarily realizing it until you are then um, close enough that it's a problem. The Schwarzschild radius for a black hole with the mass of the sun, um, so smaller than a star would actually make, is about three kilometers. So the event horizon would be a sphere that's about six kilometers across. Uh, that means that if we had our little spaceship flying around, if we imagine taking the mass of the sun in sun form, we would be um, quite a distance out where we'd notice the sun was there. It is hot, it is bright. At some point we'd be reaching the photosphere itself. So we know that we probably wanna turn our um, spacecraft around. If that same thing were a black hole instead, the same amount of mass, where gravity was functioning the same way at these different distances, we simply wouldn't know to turn around because there's not this hot, bright object. There's not a photosphere we're about to fly into. We can get, we can choose to get closer to the black hole before we start to get um, to gravity strengths that are more than our spaceship can handle. So they are not giant space vacuums. I do want you to think about that and kind of really confront your understanding about black holes. So pause the video, read through the question and the options, and only unpause once you have your answer. So this is considering like a um, Indiana Jones, like swap one thing for the other. If the sun were suddenly instantly replaced by a black hole of the same mass, we want to think about what would happen to Earth's orbit. If this were truly instantaneous, we want to recognize that the Earth would continue to orbit exactly as it did before because our orbit is based entirely on the force of gravity. If we aren't changing the mass of the black hole, then nothing about the force of gravity changes for the Earth's orbit. Certainly, life on Earth would get pretty bad pretty quick. We wouldn't have a heat source, we wouldn't have a light source. Um, but we would continue to orbit this black hole and not spiral inwards. We wouldn't um, spiral away from it either. So option three here is really um, important. If we got this wrong, I want you to take a moment and write in your notes that you are getting stuck on Hollywood misconceptions. It's not your fault, but you have to confront those. You have to confront those if we're going to have an understanding that is kind of holistic across all the different types of stellar remnants. Black holes can't be this mysterious, cool thing that you just choose not to learn the science behind. They are cool when we learn about them, just not in the way Hollywood sometimes suggests. If we are very, very close to a black hole, that would be a problem for us. So if we were like standing on the surface of a star, like on the photosphere of a star as it collapsed down, we would already be very close to the black hole and that would be bad for us. There is a process that um, astronomers have a name for called spaghettification. If you were to get too close to a black hole like this um, astronaut is doing, your feet would experience such a different force of gravity from your head that you would get stretched out. Super bad news for the astronaut. Don't try this at home. And the biggest reason to talk about it is because it gives us an opportunity to recognize that not only would people be stretched, but light would also be stretched. So we can be outside the event horizon, where light is still able to move past a black hole, but by getting near the black hole, it gets stretched a little bit, like our um, astronaut, and it gets stretched to longer wavelengths. This is called gravitational redshift, and it is different than the redshift we have from the Doppler effect. We still call it redshift because we are changing the wavelength of the light itself to lower energies, longer wavelengths, but this is caused for a different reason. So it's not Doppler redshift, it is gravitational redshift. Also really important to us, there is no blue shift um, component to this. Nothing in our, um, in our universe is known to have this kind of adding of energies. There is this hypothetical... Um, kind of philosophical idea of a um, white hole where instead of having material that kind of disappears through the black hole, 
that there's some other side, maybe in a different universe, we're getting very philosophical here, not science, um, where stuff just kind of spews out of it, and that would cause gravitational blue shifting, just adding energy to the stuff that passes by. We do not have that in our universe. Nothing in science, which requires testable ideas, nothing in science suggests that. So we want to recognize that we have two types of redshift now, but only one type of blue shift from the Doppler effect. So black holes can be observable, but um, it is hard to do so. We can really only notice them um, in a couple of finite ways. The most common way and the one that we're going to focus on for our curriculum is if they're in a binary system, because that also helps us connect with the... Um, binary systems that allowed for NOVA and type 1a supernova. So if we have a binary system of one bright thing and one dim thing, rather one bright thing and one not observably shining thing, we can look at the dynamics of the bright thing and see that there's an orbit and figure out what mass is there. If the mass is between 1.4 and 3 solar masses, then we have a hidden neutron star, and that's observable. If instead that binary system has this second object that has more than 3 solar masses, then we have a hidden um, black hole and we can kind of keep track of it and learn more about it. What's more common is if we're talking about a binary system where active accretion is happening. So again, the companion has to be kind of overflowing its sphere of influence. It has to be a red giant or super giant sending material onto the black hole. We're not talking about a giant space vacuum. The binary companion has to offer that material. We can have accretion happen that will create this disk of stuff that goes around the black hole. And then we can form disk um, jets where the jets are coming from the disk itself, they are not coming out of the black hole, but those jets of um, x-rays and the disk of hot material um, make an observable object, and we call that whole system an x-ray binary. That's how we um, kind of verified our first few dozen uh, black hole candidates, so stellar mass black hole candidates, is by studying x-ray binary systems. The other way that we can potentially study black holes is if there are two in a binary system and we wait for them to merge together. So we're not really waiting, we're hoping to find a system that has merged or is in the process of merging because two black holes that merge together or two neutron stars that merge together can create gravitational waves and that is one of the newest and kind of expanding fields of astronomy is kind of studying these objects and starting to learn more about neutron stars and black holes and what can happen when they merge together because in order to merge they have to be getting rid of excess energy and they do that by sending out gravitational waves. So the details of gravitational waves are outside the scope of our class. What we do want to recognize is that they are not part of the electromagnetic spectrum. They are the actual um, kind of crunch and expansion of the fabric of space, uh, and they have allowed us to study um, dozens of events that we'll continue to learn more about in astronomy over time, and if you're curious, you can check out the um, last section of chapter 24 in our textbook, but again, they're outside the scope of our curriculum. It's just such a cool, new, relatively new part of astronomy that I would be, be remiss not to mention it. So we've gone on long enough. Um, I will see you in the last video of the module, which is really just a um, summary of what we've covered so far. So I look forward to finishing up this module strong with you. Thanks for watching.